wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Fuad Kassab. Hi, everyone. It's Joe here, your quirky host. I still don't have Fuad with me this week, but he'll be back for sure next week. So I'm going to go on to the podcast with Becky now. Um, Becky talks about um, her boy's issues with his health growing up. Before he was five, he had so many health issues and she she was struggling with her health as well, although she didn't realize how bad she was until she started to bring in the good foods and her body started to go, woohoo, let's, let's start getting rid of the toxins. And then she got really sick. And then she had to work through her health um, issues as well. Fascinating story. And um, this lady has so much experience. She's been a naturopath for many years. And um, you, you will just be amazed at all that she can, uh, can tell you and can help you with. So I'll just explain. Um, let's see. So she's a traditional naturopath. Um, she sees clients in Georgia, in America. She works as a, certif- a certified GAPS practitioner. She sees clients in her office and by Skype and phone. She's been published in Wise Traditions, spoken at two Western A Price conferences. Um, she also speaks at certified GAPS practitioner trainings. She's been on many radio shows, television shows. She writes for Nourishing Plot. Um, and she continues her education, specializing in leaky gut and parasitology through Duke University. She just finished that with a distinction, actually. She's a chapter leader for the Western A. Price Foundation, and you will really love this podcast. If you have any interest at all in health, you'd love it, but especially if you are interested in healing with food. So enjoy the podcast, guys, and I hope to see you soon at a seminar or a conference or something. And if we haven't been to your area yet, don't worry, we are hoping to come. Okay, have a great week, everyone. Bye. Hello and welcome to Becky. So lovely to have you with us. I'm so glad to be here. It's good to see you, Joe. I'm actually I said us because I'm so used to having Fuad with me, but he's not here today. <laughs> he's on a wil- <laughs> he's on a wilderness retreat um, and doing a four day oh. water fast. So I think he goes home today. Ah. So I'll be interested to see how oh, he went. <laughs> I, I have yeah, I've heard him on the other podcast. He sounds fantastic. Yeah, he's great. Well, we'd love to hear a bit about your background and your story first, if you don't mind starting with that, Becky, because um, it sounds like you've been through quite a journey with your son. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I never thought that I would be doing something like this. Because no, neither did I. <laughs> it, I come from a family where you get whatever food is cheapest. Yes. And and you, just, you cook what is easiest and you just move on mm-hmm. and... If I had not been so sick, if we had not had a situation where my son was so sick and where I was so sick, I, I promise you I would be eating 13 cent ramen noodles at every single meal oh, wow. because what's easiest, whatever is cheapest. I, I'm kind of thankful that we were so sick that we had no other choice. Ah, you got That's desperate easy. enough to change. <laughs> oh, yeah. My mm. son, before he was even five, he was autistic. Mm-hmm. He was uh, ADHD, bipolar, dyslexia, wow. hypoglycemic, and I homeschooled them. This was back years ago. And how many and, kids did um, you have? I have two. Mm-hmm. My oldest just turned 18, and I'm still in denial. And, uh, <laughs> my, <laughs> Don't worry. My oldest 16. just turned 20, and I feel so old. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't think I'd be this person, but... <laughs> So ha- and, goes and, and your, or not. yes, your oldest one didn't have problems, just the younger one. Correct. And sometimes it happens that way. Yeah. Sometimes the Strange, first baby is the one that's, yeah, it's just different for each family. Yeah. You know, looking back now, I could see where we could have rebuilt and strengthened the older one also. But I'll be honest with you, over 99% of my time was spent with my, my gap son. Mm. He was, it was really bad. Everything in our house was broken. Wow. It, it, I had to hold his hand so tight if we were ever out in public that I honestly thought I was going to break the bones in his hands. I'm not mm. kidding and I'm not exaggerating. If I weren't holding his hand that tight, he would bolt and run so fast that it was one of those kind of drop everything and mm. tear after him, praying with all your might, 
please let me catch him. Wow. He would fling himself in taxi cabs and, oh, and wow. just, just explosive behavior. He had bloody noses that were uncontrollable and got progressively worse and worse and worse over the years. It was a CSI crime scene oh, wow. kind of a situation when he was, it was, uh, it was adventurous. I would have black eyes because he would <sighs> give me a hug and kiss. And, uh, and that was just a normal day. And it was wow. hard. It was really hard. And so we were, this is at the time where the GAPS book was not really known. She had just come out with the GAPS book. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't known publicly at that time. And we were waiting for specialists and specialists and specialists mm. for, for more labels, which make no difference looking back for more direction, hoping somebody would just be able to help us. And uh, in the course of, I remember (laughs) calculating this out, in the course of a summer, like from May until October, so an extended summer, we lived in Miami Beach at the time, so that was our summer. Yeah. We spent $775 in co-pays going to doctors, where each doctor visit was $25. Mm, Wow. That's a lot of doctor's visits. It was. I had no more answers at the end of that than I did at the beginning of it. I was even more frustrated. I remember at the last one where we were leaving and I just said, I am not going back anymore because it wasn't getting us anywhere. And uh, that doctor actually told me that I was the problem. She said, your son is this way because you're a bad mom. He doesn't oh, listen to you. Awful. You don't have parenting skills. And I said, that's mean. But we're driving home in the car and I'm crying because I thought, finally, somebody's going to be able to help me. This is going to be the one. And I'm just so upset. And my son just peeps up out of the back seat in his little child voice. And he says, it's okay, mom, we'll figure it out. Oh, and during this, I know, <laughs> during this whole time, we kept praying and praying because there were times that I could see him in there. Hmm. There were times he was lucid and there were times he was just a the human tornado. Yeah. And could see him in there. I remember this one time he had, um, he kept getting drippy noses and, and when he would get a drippy nose, he, he, it would burn his skin. And I, we took him to the doctor and talked about it. And he said, well, it's because you're a bad parent. He literally said that you need to wipe his nose faster. What? So I had boxes of tissues <laughs> everywhere. In my That's house the most ridiculous boxes. thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I had probably 10 boxes of tissues in my house so that it would be closer to me. So one day we were sitting there playing cars on the carpet. And as I'm playing with it, I'm just looking at him. And as I'm looking at him, his nose starts to run. And I reach over and grab a tissue because it's literally right next to me. So I'm being a better mom because it's my fault. And I wipe his nose and it's about halfway between his nose and his lip at this point in time. And as it's running down his face, I see it burning his skin under under the liquid as it's running down. So I wipe his nose and sure enough, he had that burn drip mark for a good solid four days. And I would just cry out to the Lord and I would say, something is going on here. You know his body better than any one of these doctors. It is proving to not be successful for us. We're not getting anywhere. There's times where I can see him. Just show me, Mm -hmm. show me what is happening. Mm -hmm. And Every time I would pray that prayer, the answer would come that day. Wow. And sometimes it would come immediately. Never before in my life has there ever been answers so quickly. And every time it was answered. And that's what led us to full gaps. I didn't even know we were doing full gaps hmm. until three years after we oh, had wow. been on full gaps. And he had already been normalized. He was a normal person, no diagnoses, no labels. In less than a year's time. Of of, of just full gaps. Just full gaps. Not everybody has to go so soon. Yeah. It depends. That's really encouraging because there's so many parents that go, I just can't do intro. It's just too much. And just to hear that you you healed so many things on full gaps. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, is nobody can tell you where to start. No. Only that person's body can tell you where to start. That's right. And if you make one better step today or tomorrow or one better step a week, you're closer to an answer. Yes. The thing is, is that kids heal faster when they're younger. So I'm very, mm. very thankful for that. Uh, we all ate the same way that my son ate because we didn't want him to feel weird. 
And that's when I started realizing how many problems I had. Mm. I had not been with any issues up until then because I think I was just in de- denial and yeah. and brushing up myself. But they all came out when when we started eating that way. I think because when your body is in a state of decline, it is in overdrive, trying to maintain and trying to maintain. Then when you take all that inflammation out, your body doesn't have to try anymore. It can just go, oh, yeah. And what's in there is now visible. Yes. And so I was the one that took longer to heal. So if it hadn't been for the fact that we had been on get full gaps for three years, and then I started intro, still to this day, my son has not had any diagnoses or illnesses or issues for over 12 years. Wow. And he's never done intro. Yeah. It's amazing. So I, who kept getting sicker, so I ended up having a whole slew of things that I never knew that I even had. I also was hypoglycemic. Mm -hmm. I had POTS, which is a disease where you stand up from a sitting position, you get dizzy or you actually pass out. Wow. I had Hashimoto, which is a thyroid autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. I had irritable bowel syndrome. I had stage two spinal degeneration. I had stage four adrenal fatigue. I was hypothyroid. I had heavy metal toxicity during the time I was trying to heal, and I had taken a, a, an amalgam filling, a silver filling in my tooth, broke my tooth, and I had to go to the dentist to get it taken out, and I mm-hmm. didn't know there was a difference between a holistic dentist or a biological dentist and a regular dentist. And he took it out improperly, and mm-hmm. I felt myself swallow pieces, and they go oh, down. No. And I think the heavy metal toxicity that I acquired from that was literally um, disabling. I had a a really good case of Helicobacter pylori when I was 16. I had my first ulcer. I had carpal tunnel, brain fog, tinnitus. I had foot fungus and eczema. When I was 16, my hair started turning gray. By the time I was in my mid-30s, 35% of my hair was gray. That's most of that has reversed. Now it's coming back again. Really? He doesn't take it for oil. Yeah, gray hair is just a vitamin E deficiency. And uh, when it's all like crinkly and fly hair like. Yeah, just having fermented cod liver oil, cod liver oil, Rosita, uh, Nordic Naturals, that's a really high in vitamin E. And if you're actually taking like a fermented cod liver oil and a high vitamin butter oil at the same time, you'll immediately see the difference oh, wow. in your hair. Okay, I'm going to try that. I'm going to get a few actually, gray hairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to actually color my hair many, 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 many years ago. And I stopped. Because I just was like, this is so bad for you. Do you know mm. that a lot of cancer comes from that dark hair coloring? Wow. And uh, it's not like the red lipstick, but it, all the chemicals in there are really mm. bad for your body. Yeah, you hear about but hairdressers remember, having major problems because of it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I remember I was taking my fermented cod liver oil really regularly. And then I stopped because, you know, about a year and a half later, I was like, okay, let's see how I do with this. And my kids asked me. Mom, you need to color your hair again. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, like, oh, I haven't colored my hair in years. And then I started taking it again. That's and they asked me, I'm good. I'm glad you started coloring your hair again. I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> it's, just, it's just when you feed your body what it needs, it oh, can be when you support so it properly, it can repair itself. That's so interesting. Sorry, I, I got hung up on that one. Keep going. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. I had severe patient my whole entire life. I don't think I moved my bowels on a regular basis until I was in my uh, late 30s. I thought it was normal to That's... move your bowels every 15 days. Oh, ouch. <laughs> I must have felt so I lethargic from out. that. Well, yeah, but I didn't know. I thought no. that was normal. Right. I had, I had fibromyalgia, which Thank God, I think this is why we did just full gaps for three years. Because mm. if I had gone straight into intro, I would have gotten violently ill and right. thought, this protocol does not work. Yeah. This is just a bunch of hope. But, you know, over 50 allergies I've recovered from because mm. of of gaps. Um, I had uh, early stage cancer, which I've got nothing wow. anymore. I've had Lyme, polycystic ovarian disease. Yes. I had systemic candida. I had SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Uh, I was floxed from fluoroquinolones. That's where the tinnitus came from. Um, had issues because we lived in a house with mold. I had mm-hmm. interstitial cystitis. I was a mess. I had rosacea. I had MTHFR genetic mutations. Wow. It was a really 
really long journey of really deep down healing that need to happen. And none of that was really present until we really started because the inflammation was reduced. But I don't have any issues right now. Once you've had stage four adrenal fatigue, you're mm. a lot of those things you're not supposed to come away from. No. A stage four stage fatigue is especially one of those things. And, and I fully function. We have a very tiny farm. We oh. have, uh, I work at uh, my office. I have two teenage boys. We homeschool. I'm very active. We bike, we kayak. And I, you know, if I do it too much, if I overdo it, I'll feel the adrenal fatigue coming back. But then I know what to do to support it. Yeah. And then I'm all good. So it's just a matter of when you support the body correctly, it can heal itself. That is so amazing. What a list. <laughs> and I know, right? It's kind of insane. Oh, so you've <laughs> done, you did the full gaps for three years. And then how did you move into intro? Why, why you know, what sort of got you started with that? And you said you didn't really well, started, realize you were on, on gaps. So what did you mean? By yeah. That? Once, once we had been on full gaps for three years, we actually moved from Florida to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to a girlfriend at the time and, and I was still getting sicker and sicker and sicker during that time. I had been bitten by many ticks. So mm -hmm. I didn't realize that I had a lot at the time. So it was really bad. I was not getting out of bed. I was just fully exhausted. Stage four adrenal fatigue, you're getting out of bed maybe 20 minutes throughout the whole day. Really? And that includes your trips. Yeah. It includes your trips to the bathroom. It includes you prepping food for your family. You don't function. You don't even lay in bed and watch fun movies. Mm. You lay in bed and stare at the wall. Wow. You have nothing in you. Mm. You're just so depleted to the core. You have nothing. Wow. Um, so I was talking to her and she was just like, well, gaps, gaps. And I didn't really know because I hadn't heard the term at the time. And, and she was a chapter leader for the Weston A. Price Foundation. So she had known. And uh, I ordered the book and I was like, oh, like I was like soaking it in because I was like telling my husband, I'm like, she's saying everything we've been through. She's naming the pathogens. She's saying why this happened and why <laughs> that happened. And this all makes sense. And, you know, when you're when you're sick. And you read a book like the Gaps book, it's kind of like reading the whole Encyclopedia Britannica at the same time. You can't absorb it. Yeah. It's it's just too much to yes. take in and you're just grasping at straws. So I just kept grabbing at what I could get and do what I could. Mm -hmm. And so in, in that, in my foggy brain and inability to think and inability to function, I was doing bone broth, not knowing that there was a difference between a meat stock and a bone broth. Yeah. So I did continue to get sicker with other things that happened. And so I just literally sat myself down on the couch one day and I opened up the book to the section where she talks about making the meat stock. And I said, I'm going to follow this line by line by line because I'm clearly doing something wrong. She has all these other people. All of Dr. Natasha's other patients are healing. I'm not. I must be doing something wrong. So show <laughs> me, Lord, what I'm doing wrong. Followed it step by step by step. And made the meat stock the way she said, line by line, instead of what I knew in terms of how to cook. And it was a whole different product. Yeah. And I immediately got better. And I immediately couldn't stop drinking it. Ah. So at that time, I went from stage one to stage two. And I felt so good on stage two that I just camped out. Yeah. And I stayed on stage two for over a year. Mm -hmm. And the amount of healing that happened was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So remarkable. And I'm so glad that that was able to happen at that time. And then ever since then, I've just been on full gaps and I'll step back if I need to and come forward if I need to, depending on what I want. Mm -hmm. But it's just where you follow what your body is saying and you support your body where it needs to be supported, it can heal itself. That's so amazing. I'm interested to know how, like when you first changed your family's diet and you didn't realize it was gaps, how did you figure out what to eat? Was that just well, like we were common sense? His, or? <laughs> yeah, well, it's prayer. We yeah. it, honestly, it, it was yeah. just prayer because I would. My husband was working so many hours that I was a computer programmer widow, and I <laughs> he was probably gone over eighty hours a week. And and we lived wow. in Miami Beach, where we had moved, and we didn't know anybody, and there were a lot of people from other countries, so nobody spoke English, and mm -hmm. so it was it was just me. I was on my own. Wow. I had nobody to help. I had nobody that I knew that could babysit, and it was just me, my two boys, when my husband showed up, and God, and that's all we had. Mm. So I would just 
dial back all of our responsibilities and just focus on him because yeah. it didn't matter if we went to baseball. It didn't yes. matter if we went to choir. It, mm. What mattered was him. This is the person that I'm going to live with for the rest of my life. And in this state that he's in right now, I knew without a shadow of my doubt that he was going to be in jail mm. and I was going to be visiting my son in jail because there's no possible way. If he were doing the things he was doing at that time at four and a half and he was doing them at 18 or 19, yeah. he would be in jail. Uncontrollable. Not because he wanted to be. Yeah. Mm. Not because he wanted to be. It was because he had no other choice. Yeah. So I would just look at him and study him and I would see that there were differences in times when he ate different foods. So we just prayed and ate different foods. And what we actually did at the time, and, and I, this was to no credit of my own, is, is we would eat and then we would do school. We right. would eat and then we would do brec- we would eat breakfast and then we'd do morning school. Mm-hmm. Then we would eat lunch and then we would do afternoon school. We'd eat a snack and we continued to do school. So I could see sitting there at the table with him how his body responded yeah. to different foods. So I started making notes. All the insides of all of our cabinets were filled with papers with notes. He can't have wheat. He can't have no more than 12 grams of sugar per sitting. He can't have this color. He can't have that color. Then I read wow. in a magazine article in Europe, it's illegal to have this number blue, this number yellow, this number red, it's a felony to have those three together in candy or whatever it was. And I'm like, mm. oh, he just had that inside that two tablespoons of yogurt. No wonder oh, everything wow. is realistic after that. So that's how we just found it out. We that's just, amazing. We just came to, yeah. And we just isn't kept it giving him the fuzzy issues? This is something we talk, we talk about a lot. Um, and in our last podcast, um, we spoke about the importance of being having that quality time, not quality time, sorry, the quantity time with your child when you're oh. working on healing. You can't just um, farm them out to someone else and let them look after them and know what's going on. It just doesn't work. And I've found, um, I've talked to a lot of mums that have had to, you know, really scale back on, like you said, the sports and the extra activities and maybe even start homeschooling like we did and Um, Maybe they've had to, you know, you just have to really keep them at home for a while and focus on the healing. And it's not forever. And it's, but it's so important to spend that, just be there with them by your side, watching everything that's going on. It just makes such a difference. I agree. And I loved every second of it, even though, I mean, (laughs) I am, I would hide in the bathroom and I would go into the shower and cry and it was really hard, but I loved it. It was, they were amazing and the laughter and the joy and the smiles and the, Mm. it was, they were just, kids are just so, what a gift. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. So, um, now did you, did you, um, start as a naturopath while your kids were young or how did that begin? Yeah, well, when I was bedridden, ah, I you studied. couldn't do anything else. Yeah, I did. I studied. I was. It actually started because I would listen to other people that were professionals in the field, and and when they would say something, it, it would really bother me because I was like, oh, ho, 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 ho. if he had done that, he would have been a mess. That's not the correct information. Right. And, and I kept saying that over and over to myself in my mind, and I was like maybe I should go back to school. So I did. And I went back Mm. to school and I became a naturopathic doctor, a traditional naturopath, a certified GAPS practitioner and a doctor of pastoral sciences. I'm what's been classified. I went further. I'm classified as a practitioner who is literate in Lyme and a practitioner who is literate in iodine. I'm actually not done. I'm kind of a junkie. I'm going (laughs) to get tested in office (laughs) for a board certification as a naturopathic doctor. And then I want to go back and get my master's in iridology. So I I just love this field. I get yeah I just love it I love that you can go out in your yard and pick a weed that's growing wild that I never planted and and put it on somebody's rash and it can just disappear yeah I think it's amazing that's sort of thing it just fascinates me yeah I would love to learn while somebody else is paying yeah Yeah. somebody else is paying $80 for cream to do the same thing I had to go to the doctor sit in the office and wait for three hours to see the doctor to get a script to go to the I'd Never mind. Yeah. I'll go out in the yard. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And how, yeah. um, we, one thing, I know we've sort of taken a while to get there, but we do really want to talk about sensory processing disorder today because um, mm. we do get a lot of questions from parents or um, 
not so much questions, but even comments in our program support group from parents who are really struggling with kids with SPD and how to begin, how to get them started, because this is something that's so tricky to get them get them started on the diet because of the food texture problems and all of that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but maybe we could just start off, if you could just give us a little bit of a, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, <laughs> my, my mind's gone blank. It's. I started yeah, this at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be up tomorrow at 6.30. I can guarantee you that. So the way it starts and what is happening in the body is actually very helpful in terms of telling you what to do. Okay. So sensory processing disorder, when, when we look at things like this, it all begins in the intestinal tract. Yes. If we were to cut that intestinal tract open and lay it out flat, it would cover the area of a tennis court, even in a 13-year-old boy. Hmm. Some researchers say that it covers a tennis covers a tennis court. Others, a small amount, say that it covers a football field. Wow. It really doesn't matter. It's big. Hmm. What that looks like, if we were to really look deeply at that, is that whole tennis court looks like it's filled with a shag carpet. Mm-hmm. And all of those carpet fibers are standing up really tall, and they're actually glued together by a product made by our own body called zonulin. Mm-hmm. And those carpet fibers glued together cover that whole entire shag carpet. And if we zoom in even further, we can see at the base of every one of those carpet fibers, which are called villi, grows a little fella called an enterocyte. And that enterocyte looks like a circle with hairs that grow straight up on his head. And the hairs are really tall. And surrounding every one of those hairs are little teeny tiny balls and they go all around every one of those hairs all the way to the top. Those tiny balls are your digestive enzymes. Wow. Now, when we look at those villi, there are little teeny tiny hairs that stick out on the side of every one of those villi and those act like a conveyor belt and they take that enterocyte and move him all the way to the top of each one of those villi. And by the time he gets to the top, he's dead. He's done all his work. So all those hairs are much, 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 much smaller and they're dried up and crinkly and all of those digestive enzyme balls are gone. Mm -hmm. They're spent. He's done his job. Now this, these enterocytes are the fastest reproducing thing in our body. That is totally in our favor because our body's constantly regenerating itself. So we can support them to function properly. Now, if you look at that tennis court on top of that whole entire tennis court, is a two inch layer of mucus that sits on top of the whole tennis court. And inside this two inch layer of mucus is the end product of what those enterocyte digestive enzymes pulled in to feed the body. That two inch layer of mucus contains 40 trillion different living cells. We think up until six months ago, they used to think it was a hundred trillion different living (laughs) cells. But these are all the things like Lactobacillus, Bifidobacter, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, E. coli, all of these are individual living beings. They're Mm. microscopic. We can't see them unless we put a microscope into your intestinal tract. So if we blow that up really big, we will see there are usually a good version and a bad version of almost all of them. Good E. coli helps you to digest lactose. Bad E. coli sends you to the hospital. But when you look how these guys are interacting with each other, when one of them exhales, he's exhaling a toxic gas from inside his body. When he exhales that gas, another one eats that gas. Hmm. Now, another one, when he moves along the ground, he leaves pom-poms as his trail. Hmm. Another one eats that. They have this correlating relationship that they function together in a way that amplifies what's going on. And they actually are a symbiotic relationship They're more powerful together than they are singularly. Mm -hmm. Now, the amazing thing is, is this whole environment of microbes existing together to function together, this is available almost everywhere that we look in our planet. If we took a sample of the atmosphere, it would have a whole bunch of microbes working together. If we took a sample of your compost pile, a whole compilation of microbes of the depths of the ocean, of the ocean water, of the beach, of the tree. They're all working together with all of these living organisms. A dead tree is known to be more alive than a live tree because of all the insects Hmm. and microbes and fungus that work together 
to to make this whole entire location and world function. It's we're so perfectly and wonderfully made. Mm. It's mind blowing. Yes. But that two inch layer of mucus actually makes stuff for our body. It makes your vitamin K. It makes your vitamin G. It makes your B vitamins. It makes ALA, alpha lipoic acid. It makes glutathione. It makes a lot of stuff to nourish your body. Mm. But if something happens that depletes the good flora, the bad flora no longer have the good to keep them in check. Mm -hmm. And they literally change their shape to meet the missing microbes and they grow. There's 250 yeasts in your body. Hmm. One of those yeasts is Candida albicans. In that Candida albicans family, they some researchers say they have found 118 strains. Other researchers say they have found 187 strains. What we do know is you have a dominating one strain of Candida albicans, it's going to lead towards something like foot fungus. Mm -hmm. Another dominating strain, cradle cap. Right. Another dominating strain thrush, another dominating strain, eczema. They all do something mm -hmm. in your body. Now, if there's 250 yeasts that we know of in your body, and the one they've studied the most has over 100 strains, it's my opinion that possibly the other 249 also have over 100 strains. What we know about these yeasts is if we take away the good microbes that keep them balanced, they change their shape, and that actually classifies them as opportunistic yeasts. They start off as a circle, then they stretch their bodies out into a shape that is scientifically known as a rod. It looks like a bratwurst or a hot dog. Mm -hmm. And then they stretch themselves out even further. And if we were looking at an equal size map, they would start off the size of a golf ball and they would end up the size of a knee sock. That's a sock that goes hmm. from your toes to your knees. Yeah. When it's the knee sock size, it grows tentacles out of one side of it, and the tentacles are longer than the knee sock itself. <laughs> now, check this out. That one guy, through the course of that lifespan, going from the golf ball size to the knee sock size with the tentacles, he's exhaling 176 different toxic gases. That includes it's kind of creepy gas. thinking of that in your body. <laughs> And where is that going to go? That's yeah. what blows you up and gives you a bloated belly. Or yeah. it, has, it gives you bubbles. It has nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. They're exhaling methane gas, hydrogen gas, ethanol, which is alcohol, mm. ammonia, floor cleaner, wow. acetone, nail polish remover, mm. acetaldehyde. If you're ever hung over, that feeling flowing through your body, that's acetaldehyde. That's six. There's 176 different toxic acids wow. being released from that one guy. Now, this situation, when he's in this state, the inflammation in your intestinal tract is abounding. It doesn't look like what I described it should look like. Those enterocytes are no longer being born healthy, pulling in your food. That two-inch layer of mucus is no longer in this symbiotic relationship that keeps you healthy. It is a literal war zone. There's inflammation. Sometimes there's pus. Sometimes there's bleeding. You're not making the zonulin. So those villi are now falling over and there's holes in the floor in certain areas because those yeasts are stretching through those walls and the tentacles are strapping themselves on, on the other side mm. of your intestinal tract. In medical terminology, that is intestinal permeability. Yeah. In layman's terms, that's leaky gut. Mm -hmm. But this is not just all connected in your intestinal tract. Uh, going back, those enterocytes, they're not born with the long hairs and all those digestive enzymes at that state. They're born the same way they normally die. So you don't even have the digestive enzymes to pull in food. So now you're not getting your food. There's a lot of inflammation. There's a lot of pus. There's a lot of bleeding. And contrary to certain people's beliefs, everything in your body is connected somehow. Yes. So it doesn't just stay in your intestinal tract. It backs up into your stomach with low stomach acid. Mm. Now you have other bacteria that keep the balance in the low stomach acid, like Helicobacter pylori. It backs up into that esophageal mucus. We have a mucosal lining in our esophagus also. So now that backs up 
overloaded with pathogens. And then it also backs up into our mouth, in our Mm. saliva, which is now becoming more overloaded with pathogens instead of having the balance. So now we have the mouth area filled with pathogens instead of the good and the bad balance. That's why some of these kids are drooling Mm. because they can't contain those pathogens in their mouth. Wow. That's also why these kids have texture issues because they eat food. And if it's a good healthy food, like let's say, for example, you have a bite of olive oil and somebody with uh, SPD has a bite of olive oil. They put that olive oil in their mouth. It's a good healing food. So now it kills some of those pathogens Mm -hmm. and they release all those toxic gases, the methane, the hydrogen gas, the ammonia, the acetone, the acetaldehyde, all of those pathogens are in that person's mouth right on their taste buds. You're tasting olive oil. They're tasting nail polish remover. Ah, yes. And floor cleaner and all of these other things. Some people say it it tastes like broken glass. They're not tasting the same foods you're tasting. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can get so bad that when they put a full mouthful of something in their mouth, the pathogens start to fill the mouth and they can't find their esophagus to even swallow the food. So now they're just swishing food around and around and around in their mouth and they don't know what to do. So this is where we get sensory issues. The foods hurt. Yeah. So the ultimate goal is, number one, we need to repair that microbiome in the intestinal tract. But usually in a situation like that, if we take probiotics, whether it be a probiotic capsule, which you have to be aware of because it's an unregulated industry. There are a lot of ingredients that they're putting in those capsules Mm. that are not compliant to what a person's body should have. One example that is one of my favorite ones because it just it tickles me that this is even possible. Mm-hmm. Microcrystalline cellulose is an ingredient that they put in a lot of capsules. That's uh, These ingredients could be many things. That's usually cotton because it's cheapest. Oh. What and is it for? Is, it's just a filler. Oh. It fills up the capsule. So it's, it's not food. Wow. Cotton is a very high GMO product with yeah. glyphosate. Glyphosate is classified as an antibiotic. So here's a cool one. If you're taking a probiotic that has microcrystalline cellulose in it, you are eating an antibiotic with your probiotic and you paid $75 a bottle. Oh, no. If that, I actually wrote about this and I have all the sightings and the people that, so don't come talking to me about that's not true. (laughs) Just look at the the studies that I posted on Nourishing Plot. Just Google that and Mm. it'll come out and you can see it all. If that, if that supplement is from Taiwan, it's actually people's old clothes wow. that are no longer wearable. They wash and they grind up and pulverize into a powder and put that in as the microcrystalline cellulose. You. So you could put a... Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what a strange an world job. we live in. What, what the... I know. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not food... You've got to laugh or you cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When you put in a probiotic capsule on your mouth, make sure that it's clean. It doesn't have these added ingredients. So I have all of the gaps, not all of them, but a lot of the gaps approved probiotics that are uh, most applicable to folks on nourishing plot, the best rated probiotics. Mm. But, But you can just sprinkle one of those capsules of probiotics on your tongue before the person goes to sleep. and That will repopulate that saliva, the mouth flora. You could also just put drops of kraut juice or drops of milk kefir or drops of kombucha to help repopulate that flora. Mm. Um, I actually just wrote a book. Dr. Natasha is reading it right now. Sally Fallon just uh, sent me back that she'd finished it. And that she asked me to write a couple of articles for the journal in some of the chapters on it, but it's on food-based probiotics versus commercial probiotics. Oh, I'm looking forward to reading that. That'll be good. (laughs) All the information from like the microcrystalline cellulose, the yep. silica, the magnesium stearate. That's how I know all that stuff just mm. from studying it from there. Will this be ebooks these, or actual books? Uh, they'll be available on Amazon. Yeah, you can do a Kindle book. You can yep. do a, a hard copy book, whatever whatever you prefer. It's just making um, me curious if you have other books. Oh, I do. I have oh. um, I have four books. Oh, I have four oh books well, you can tell us about that out. when at the end, maybe, yeah, and we can not. put links. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the probiotic foods have this balance mm-hmm. in them. 
that is very easily absorbed in the body. So that's easily way to absorb nutrition, yep. to absorb all of the flora that your body needs. For example, if you have a yeast issue, a lot of people will say, oh, take Saccharomyces boulardii. It's very strong against yeast, which it is. Mm. The problem with that is if you take a Saccharomyces boulardii capsule, who knows what the other ingredients are in there? Yeah even if they don't list them, because if it's industry standard, they don't have to list it on the ingredient list. But milk kefir made from raw milk that is from a real cow, a heritage breed cow, it has three strains of Saccharomyces boulardii. Wow. And it has the other accompanying strains that make the Saccharomyces boulardii effective. Whereas the capsule, it doesn't work solo. Mm. If I told you, Joe, garden and pick me some vitamin E. <laughs> you cannot do it. No. You are always going to have all these other cofactors that that's the way your body recognizes it. So fermented foods, number one, cheaper. Mm. Number two, it's in the form of God, the way God made it for our bodies to absorb. Mm -hmm. Number three, it's got all of these different benefits for our body that we don't even realize are there. And then most importantly, probably, is they're stronger. Mm. And dumping those on your mouth before somebody goes to sleep will change the flora of your mouth and taking whatever probiotic a child will eat will also change that flora from internally like kombucha a lot of kids love kombucha mm. some of them love yo some of them love kefir there is a um a, a university professor a college professor in the university of florida her name is monica Oli. she came over from germany and she's a microbiology professor and, and when she got here, of course, she looks at us Americans and she says, they're not eating any sauerkraut. They're not eating any milk kefir. <laughs> so she got herself some grains and she found a raw goat milk farmer from the farmer's market, started making her own milk kefir. But then she realized, I have all these microbiology students. I have pre-med. I have pre-dental, which gives us hope for the future. <laughs> but she had these students grow these foods on plates in yeah. the lab. They went to the store and they got normal cheap yogurt from the store, Yoplait or Dannon, and then they got like a Lifeway kefir, and they went and they grew those on the plate in the lab. Then they went and they got a better quality one from the store, like a Publix brand or an organic brand, and they grew those on the plates in the lab. Then she made the milk kefir from the raw goat's milk and the yogurt from the raw goat's milk, and they grew those on the lab. And what they found is shocking. Hmm. The cheap yogurt and kefir from the store had grown about five different strains of probiotics. She quote unquote said, these are dead foods. Yeah. The better quality ones had probiotic strains in the high hundreds, which looking at five or seven is pretty strong. Mm -hmm. But the raw milk that was fermented into yogurt or kefir had in the high hundreds of billions. Wow. It's fascinating. So fascinating. Mm. So, I mean, here you could be choosing to eat yogurt or kefir. You could be doing nothing for your body or you can doing amazing work for your body. Mm. So if you put those drops on the tongue, it will help to repopulate the flora of the mouth. If you put them inside the intestinal tract, it will help to repopulate the flora. Now, all these probiotic strains are transient. None of them stay the same way food doesn't stay. It passes through. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep taking them in. So whatever they like, that's what I would focus on and build until they are doing more. And as you change the flora in the intestinal tract, it changes the sensory processing disorder as a symptom, not as a root source. So right. the root source is the intestinal tract. That's where the attention goes. Yeah. Whew. So interesting. So for some, for some people out there who are, beginning this um, journey with their kids with sensory processing disorder what's the first step what how do you begin because I know like you said you give them something good to eat and they're going to freak out because it tastes like acid on their tongue how do you begin yeah well usually kids in this situation really don't eat much when we started my son was on three foods wow. he would only eat three foods what were and they and it's usually either uh, it was junk total yeah. crap yeah it's just white <laughs> it food like a crap. Like a <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. Um, he, the thing is, is they usually will either eat the foods that make them feel good or that really tickle their taste buds. So sometimes that includes a good food. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. But most times it includes those foods that feed those pathogens. So Dr. Natasha actually says when those pathogens are flowing in that intestinal tract, all those little microbes are exhaling their toxic gases. They go from your intestinal tract through your vagus nerve to the opiate receptors of your brain. Mm. So they literally respond like a drug addict. Yeah. So when you look at it that way, you're taking crack away from a four-year-old yeah. and meth away from a three-year-old. So you have to be kind of tricky. So in my opinion, it's very easy to change things for the kids if you give them what is close to what they will normally eat. So for example, if they will only eat pizza, there are pizza recipes that you can make. I've got a recipe on Nourishing Plot for Pizza where you do mm-hmm. the crust out of like almond flour and cheese and uh, eggs and you mix that together and you put your toppings on top, it can be nice. healthy. Yeah. So now you can just switch the food for a food, same kind of food, and they will eat whatever they want. You can also just keep building on that. Now you can also do what Dr. Natasha recommends in the book, which is very effective, which is the ABA yes. therapy, Applied Behavioral Analysis. Um, for some parents, that's very scary. Mm. The thing is, you don't have to throw everything away out of your cabinets. Just the next time you buy something, buy something cleaner. Mm. And eventually, we don't have that food. So in that time frame that you are transitioning your cabinets, you can also be putting in probiotic foods that change that flora. And what we see more often than not is it's not a battle because the transition was slow and easy to adjust to. That was how we found it. Yeah, same. Starting at full gaps is a very safe place to start. Going to intro is a very safe place to start. Nobody can tell you where to go except for that individual person or you. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is, is start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Make some motion. It's, we live in a time today where stopping at a restaurant is so easy. Picking up uh, some takeaway is so easy. We just have to get back in the kitchen. You Mm -hmm. know, I remember... (laughs) I remember standing at my kitchen, dirty dishes. The kitchen is a pit. I'll be honest with you. My kitchen's a pit most times. I have a woman who really <laughs> cooks for their family. Her kitchen's a pit. <laughs> so we could just That's take right. that out of our little arsenal of what we shouldn't be. But yeah. I remember standing in my kitchen, cooking all the time, mm. not leaving my kitchen, and thinking to myself, thank you, Lord, that I don't have to pick buckets up and go back to the back of my property to scoop it out of the river (laughs) to bring it in to wash these dishes. It's just a never ending story. But, you know, look at what look at what it was like in the 30s. I know. And the next we've got it so easy, but we feel like we don't. (laughs) Yeah, We need to not look at why this is so hard for me, Mm. why this is so much work, why this is so much more expensive. We need to look at it as I'm no longer going to have to go to the doctor. I'm no longer going to have to be sick. Mm. I'm no longer going to have to visit my son in jail because all of that stuff goes away when you feed the person properly. Yeah. Their bodies can repair themselves. Mm. When you're starting kids on fermented foods, have you got some tips for like, especially if they're going to detox badly and they're going to react um, and you need to start really slowly would you start with the drop of sauerkraut juice in the water and just begin that way? Yeah, it really depends on what they can tolerate. You know, mm. even Dr. Natasha says, I was talking to her back in November and she says, you know, we used to be able to, when I wrote the book, we could start with a teaspoon yeah. of the fermented vegetable brine. We can't do that anymore. We're more toxic today than we mm. were then. So my, my 18 year old, when he, when we started and he was much younger, he could drink a whole quart of kraut juice. Yeah. And, Not and I, yeah, I had to put one drop in a full quart of water. Oh, really? And take that, yeah, yeah, it was bad. If I, I remember, I remember I started this new probiotic and I, I took one drop in the morning and then we went on our, our schooling day and everything was going great. And I had this low grade headache and I thought to myself, I never have headaches, but you know, so be it, move on. And the next day I took one drop and I had a headache. And then the third day I literally stood there at my refrigerator door and said to myself, Becky, put on your big girl panties. Take two <laughs> drops. It's not such a big deal. Uh-oh. And I, uh-huh, I took two drops and I didn't get out of bed for five days. Really? My, 
Wow. My joints hurt so bad. I laid in bed in a fetal position, just moaning. Oh, my how teeth awful. were on fire because the, the nerves connecting my teeth were inflamed. Wow. I was just moaning in so much pain, just felt so bad. Going to the bathroom, not knowing which end it was coming out of, just oh, in the fetal wow. position. If I sat up, I could hear the liquid sloshing in my head. Clearly, mm. I couldn't handle two drops. No. So, <laughs> wow. So you have to. You have to start where you can. So yeah. the thing that we can evaluate, number one, is what are the symptoms in this person? How bad off are they? Well, they're not so bad. They don't have a whole lot of symptoms. Maybe we can start with one drop. Well, no, they are pretty bad off. They have a lot of symptoms. Maybe we should dilute that just to be safe. So start wherever you think you can start and go off of the foods that you think they may like. Some kids love kimchi. Mm. Others won't touch it. They will touch yogurt. So whatever they will go for is what I would do and just yeah. make it as easy as possible for them. It's okay to stir a little bit of honey and homemade vanilla into that yogurt or that milk kefir mm -hmm. to make it more palatable. And then you can back off of that as they keep building. Mm -hmm. But starting somewhere and looking for their die off, if you overstep, because honestly, nobody knows yeah. how much they can tolerate. If they take too much... And you do have all those die-off symptoms. I wish I had known this back then. But you can take Rescue Remedy, which is a Bach flower remedy, and just put four drops on your tongue, and it really shuts it down pretty quickly. Oh, you can do that every okay. 10 or 15 minutes, and it's totally gone. There's no fear because you've got that bottle. Okay, that's that good to know. <laughs> yeah. Detox baths will help flush it through. Remember, this is stuff dying. Mm. So anything that you do to get that out, enemas or coffee enemas, that will help. High votes vitamin C will help flush it out. Anything to get it out is helpful. Mm. Detox baths will help get it out through the skin. Hot teas will help warm up the system and meat stock. So there's a lot of things you can do if you do too much and you have a, a healing crisis, mm. a Herxheimer effect, too much die off. So there's really no fear. You just have to realize there's tools in my toolbox. Yeah. When the body says this, I do this. So it's all about reading the body to tell where to go next. That's good. What about outside um, influences um, on these kids, like um, being particularly sensitive to chlorine and maybe they're doing swimming for school? Or, um, what, what would you suggest for that kind of thing? I've had parents ask about that. What do I do about – would you just take them out of swimming until they're healed or would you not ever let kids swim in chlorine <laughs> for GAPS that's kids? That's a really or? good question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, – Specifically, the chlorinated pool is a really good question. So mm. I might not give you the answer that is the correct answer. I may not give you the answer that Dr. Natasha would say. She says swim in streams and lakes and natural mm. bodies of water. It's not always possible, and we have to choose something. Yeah. I really do believe that it is much more important that your child does not drown mm. than it is for them to be exposed to halides. Yeah. So remember, chlorine is a halide. Okay. If you were to look at the periodic table of elements, column number 17 is your halides. You have fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodine. Mm -hmm. Iodine should be filling your cells, but it's not because we're very deficient in iodine. So mm -hmm. now those other halides, which look like the iodine, will fill the cells. So we can give ourselves our own sheet of armor by filling ourselves with the iodine that we need. We can paint iodine to start. Mm -hmm. This is a controversial topic. There are yeah. some people that say hey, iodine is not part of the GAPS protocol. I've asked Dr. Natasha three different times at three different seminars, uh, what about iodine? And she has straight up said, we have so many more toxic halides in our environment now that we need to do more than paint. So mm -hmm. when you do a protocol like an iodine protocol, it should be fitting to the GAPS protocol because there's a lot of cofactor supplements that you should be taking according to certain iodine protocols that are already part of the GAPS protocol for food. So you're already getting those. Yeah. But I'm a fan of doing the iodine and getting it to the level that the person needs so that they can swim mm. and they can be comfortable. If you take a shower before you get in the pool, your hair follicles are like straws. They will suck up that shower water. Now they can't suck up the pool water. So okay, you're not getting so that as helps. much in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You take a shower right after you come out of the bath, out of the cool. swimming pool. Mm -hmm. That'll help to wash it off. B wash yourself with vitamin C. Take a detox bath as soon as you get home. Mm. Take extra vitamin C. 
I do think it's more important to swim. Yeah. Now to know how to swim. My husband had a, a brother that drowned when he was oh. five, and it's just it's it's, it's a skill that everybody needs to have. It, yeah. it is awful, but it's all part of, part of the plan. So <laughs> you know, in terms of would I allow my kid to be a competitive swimmer in the pool all the time? They know how to swim. It's all good. Probably not. Mm. I I'm. You know, if their iodine levels are fine, they're still breathing. There's a floating toxic gas uh, layer above the pool water. I used to be a competitive swimmer. Oh, really? And, um, you're breathing that in all the time, and yeah. it can get you sick. Mm. Now, that's good. Thank you. And um, you've brought up the iodine question, which we get a lot. So could you just explain a little bit about that iodine protocol? I know you've written about that. Um, you, I know you explained a tiny bit just then, but... Um, for those who don't know, what do you mean by iodine painting and how does it help? Sure. So Dr. Natasha does recommend that you use Lugol's iodine and you start with the 5%. There's many different uh, strengths of right. iodine. Lugol is a formulation of iodine. It comes from Dr. Lugol, who was in the early part of the century, who he learned from the Indians how to formulate the iodine from the seaweed. It's the balance between potassium iodide and potassium iodine in the exact form that your body, your cells, different cells need different forms. It's in the exact form that your body needs. So we could start by painting that iodine and we want to paint it on the soft areas of our skin. And Dr. Natasha recommends like a three by three inch square and not everybody can start there. Some have to dilute one drop wow. and start painting with that. So uh, I have one client who, even if she brushes her teeth in chlorinated water, is sick for days. Wow. So some, that's somebody who's got an overload of halides yep. in their body. So okay. we need to start where your body can start. So if you're painting iodine, you paint in the soft spots, the inside of your arms, the inside of your legs, your stomach area, and it will absorb as your body will take it in. That's not really a, a good marker of am I iodine deficient or not. Uh, okay. Because it sizes. It's in an amber bottle for a reason. Once you take it out of that amber bottle, it's not really pristine. It's not just going to absorb in. Your cells of your body are infinitely wise. They will take in what they need, where they need at that time, but that doesn't mean they're full. It just mm. means that's all they need at that moment in time. And then once we start, if there's a need to do the iodine internally, like I said, and, and I know that I'm going to get flack from this because another practitioner has asked Dr. Natasha, and she said, no, just painting. And I don't know why she said both. I would like to ask her that in person <laughs> instead of our communication that we currently do. Yeah. So um, when you do it internally, you also want to do Lugol's, but you want to start internally with the 2% yeah. because it's lower and slower. Now, the protocol that is the, the one to follow, that is how you do it properly inside, if you want to learn more information on how iodine affects the body, would be Dr. David Brownstein's protocol. He's very vocal about how to use iodine. There are two camps in the medical community on how to use iodine. One medical camp says if you have more than 150 micrograms of iodine, you're going to kill yourself. You'll poison yourself and die, and it's all your fault. <laughs> and then the other, the other camp says we're seeing these people who are just grossly iodine deficient, and they started really increasing the amount, the numbers of iodine that they were taking, and they noticed so many things were getting better. The cysts disappeared, tumors disappeared, cold hands and feet disappeared, mm -hmm. hair falling out disappeared, depression disappeared, anxiety disappeared, polycystic ovarian disease disappeared. The skin tone came back from a pasty white to a normal skin tone. A lot of things happened. So basically when they started this, they were terrified they were going to kill somebody because that's mm -hmm. what their peers were saying. So they tested them every step of the way. And after about 8,000 people coming out, taking over 100,000 times the recommended iodine dosage, they were like, okay, clearly there's not really a restriction here because nobody has died. Yeah. Nobody has poisoned. It's all good and things are just getting better. The thing is, is with a person who's got a severe decline in their microbiome, we can't really do it that way. We can't really take all the supplements that they're recommending because yeah. – of the supplement industry again. So we need to do it with food. So if you're eating organ meats and mm -hmm. egg yolks and milk kefir and butter and marrow bones, you're getting those cofactors that are recommended. So you're already getting those. 
you may need to supplement with some vitamin C if you're not getting enough kraut juice, which is very high in vitamin C. Mm -hmm. But what you want to do is for two weeks, you want to take your salt loading and you want to take your selenium. If you don't take selenium, you can throw yourself into Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. And Dr. David Bernstein and Lynn Farrow, they explain that thoroughly in their books. If you are um, just jumping into the iodine without taking the salt loading or the Brazil nuts, you could throw yourself into a bromide detox. Right. So the Brazil nuts are how a GAPS person would take their selenium. So the FDA actually studied the Brazil nuts years ago, and, and I've also got this study on Nourishing Plot. They found that anywhere from two Brazil nuts to eight Brazil nuts contain the 200 micrograms of selenium that your body needs. So basically what you want to do is keep your Brazil nuts in the freezer because there's an oil in the Brazil nuts that can go pretty quickly Okay. and just eat them. And if you really need that selenium, you'll probably be like, oh my gosh, those are so good. Yeah. <laughs> so you need them. So keep eating them. And then as you keep eating them, you'll be like, oh, they're okay. And as you keep eating them, they eventually have no taste to you hmm. because you're no longer attracted to them, no longer needing what's in them. So that's how you kind of mark what you're taking for your Brazil nuts. Anybody that says, oh, two Brazil nuts, that's all you need. You can't tell somebody that. No. They have no idea it's what they're different for everyone. Are. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost impossible to poison yourself with food. Your body yes. will stop eating yeah. before you overdose on something. You'll be turned off it. Yeah. There's, a, there's one lady, there's a study that I was reading. She's a little Korean girl. And she was an older woman and she was trying to be healthy. So she was juicing cabbage to be healthy. Hmm. We all know that uh, goitrogenic food is going to give you a, a problem with your thyroid. Mm. and It's going to make you really tired. She was a little Korean lady. She was older. She was juicing five heads of Napa cabbage a day. Oh, no way. <laughs> for, once she got to about month four... She started getting really tired because it was negatively suppressing her thyroid. Yeah. And then when she got to month five, the beginning of month six, she was just so tired she couldn't function. They took her to the emergency room and they saw how much it was negatively infecting her, her thyroid. They gave her a little bit of thyroid medicine. She came right back to life. She was totally fine. That's five heads oh of goodness. cabbage a day for five months. So it's really kind <laughs> of impossible to overdose on food. You'll, you'll have to either be so mentally powerfully strong that I'm going to eat this yeah. or you'll just stop eating because yeah. you're just, you're good. So it's not a concern of mine. Uh, Dr. David Brownstein recommends that the Celtic gray salt is really most fitting for people that have an iodine need. So, mm, so we take salt. the salt, take, I do too, right? Mm. So when I first started taking it, it felt like it tasted like candy to me. Oh, it's it so good. It makes everything taste awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't believe I poisoned myself with the other stuff for so many years. Mm. I'm good at that. I'm good at doing <laughs> it wrong. So, so after we do that for two weeks, we continue to do that while we're on iodine. And what we do is we just start putting one drop of iodine in our water in the morning. And then what he recommends is you titrate up, which means you take another drop every three days until you get to your sweet spot. This would be an adult. Mm -hmm. A sweet spot is usually somewhere between 70 milligrams and 120 milligrams. It really depends on the person. Some people need more. I take way more than that. Some people need less. It depends on the person. But when you're at your sweet spot, it feels like somebody turned the lights on. Hmm. You can think clearly. You don't have to make lists for everything. Oh, you can walk in. <laughs> remember, you remember why you walked into the room. You have mental clarity. That is, you feel like you were on your game yes. inside your head. You just remember things that you read, you remember things that you see on documentaries. As you're talking to people, the words that come out of your mouth are big, intelligent words. And you <laughs> think to yourself, as you're talking to them, look at me, I didn't even read the dictionary this morning. <laughs> you're, just, you're just mentally on it. Yeah. And you start losing weight, you're less puffy, you uh, start moving your bowels more regularly, you have uh, the clarity of mind, the brain fog is gone, the cold hands and feet are gone the hair stops falling out. You're just in this sweet spot. Hmm. And then the thing is, is if you're not sure if that is your sweet spot and you continue to increase the drops of iodine that you're taking, if it's too much, all that stuff goes away. Uh -huh. And you're back in that deficiency state again, even though you're taking so much. What they think is happening is the cells identify it as too much and they close down. Right. So now you just have expensive urine. So if that happens, that's why Dr. Natasha says, 
the overload symptoms can be the same symptoms as not enough. Right. So if that happens, just back up into your sweet spot zone. Now, here's the problem with GAPS people. When we have this damage in our microbiome, there's a lot of inflammation. And when we have inflammation, there's different parasites, there's worms, they eat off the inflammation. When you're taking iodine, there's no parasite that can live in the presence of iodine. Hmm. There's no worm that can live in the presence of iodine. There's no bacteria that can live in the presence of iodine. There's no virus that can live in the presence of iodine. There's no cancer. Hmm. So all of these things, as you're increasing the iodine levels, have to die. So most GAPS people cannot do that. They cannot yeah. just boop, 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 boop with their doses, get to their sweet spot. Hallelujah, the clouds open up and everything is great. That <laughs> generally can't happen because yeah. all that's dying. Instead, we have to go very slow. That's why it's important that you work with a practitioner who knows what they're talking about. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say. Would you recommend, if you're going to do an iodine treatment, better go through a practitioner? For a GAPS person, I sure would, yeah. Yeah. Because you can really cause yourself a lot of damage and stir mm. up a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be stirred up. The same way you don't just tell somebody, hey, go start eating a jar of sauerkraut with every meal. Yeah. You need to really go slow yes. and take it step by step. So now when you're dealing with a child, they don't re- recommend that you get that high on your dosage. Dr. Brownstein says in two different places, he says two different dosages. In his book, he says 0.11 milligram per kilogram of body weight. In his a video on YouTube, he says 0.33 milligrams of iodine per kilogram of, of body weight. If you've got the 2% Lugols and you're holding that dropper straight up and down, every drop has 2.5 milligrams. Right. If it's the 5%, every drop has 6.5 milligrams. So you just go by what is happening. And, the, and usually you stay really, really low. But if you've got those iodine levels saturated in the person... Not really concerned about a pool, but like I said, I would do it to learn how to swim. Mm. I would go to a natural spring, a natural river, a pond. You've got to choose what is the best for you and your family. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, we have, I don't think my kids have been in a pool for a very long time. We have so many lakes and rivers here. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's, it's much more fun to swim in a lake or a river. Sure in my is. Opinion. Sure is. Well, we've covered a lot of, a lot of, um, Really interesting topics. Thank you so much. I should probably finish up because it's been an hour, um, but you're fascinating to listen to, and I'm really, really happy that you came on the show. Thank you so much. Uh, Good to meet you. I love being here. Yeah, well, I will put um, some links to your site and everything, but can you just maybe finish off with telling us about your books and where we can find them? Sure. Well, the previous books that I've written are on Miami Beach. They're tourist books from when we live there. (laughs) That's the first three books. The first one's on uh, Lincoln Road. The second one's on Ocean Drive. The third one's on the Fountain Blue, which was the first hotel (laughs) that had stuff to do when you were there. And then the fourth one is the Proverbs 31 Woman. Yeah, it's a it's called a it's called Faction. It is a historically true, but the characters are made up. But the things they do are what they did at that time. The one that I'm working on, uh, the one that I finished that Dr. Natasha is still reading right now is the Commercial Probiotics versus Food Probiotics. Mm some fascinating studies in there that can, you know, which, which food probiotic will take care of MRSA. MRSA can't live in the presence of this food probiotic, which one for staff, staff right. can't live in the presence of this, which one for eczema, which mm-hmm. one for, uh, uh glyphosate poisoning. So it, it really kind of guides you through as mm. to what to do, where, when gives you more information on, on, on what they really are and makes you feel more comfortable with what you're doing as a mom who's learning all of this stuff out of nowhere. Mm. So that one should be out um, probably within the next four months. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're trying to get a website together. We're just, it's, we're over. Takes time, doesn't it? Yep. And we'll have them all connected on there, but until then I'll, they'll just be on nourishing plot. Okay. Um, The one that I'm currently working on right now is I'm, I'm very much, um, in touch with Dr. Natasha to make sure that it's exactly what she wants to say is the, it's the gaps protocol by stage with recipes oh, and good. it goes from stage one because when I was in the beginning, there's no way I could have really made sense of what do I do now when what I can I have now? <laughs> there's a lot of misinformation out there yeah. and it's just, it's just the protocol laid out nice and simply step by step by step. It's, it's 
getting pretty big. It's a pretty big book right now. But, yeah. But, uh, but I'm still working on that one. And then uh, when I met with Dr. Natasha in November, and we talked for quite a big time and getting more information, questions and answers, you know, mm-hmm. where does gelatin fall on the yes. protocol? Where does... <laughs> Where do peppercorns, where do we eat those? Where is, you know, turnips? and just All those nitty gritty questions right that get people confused. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. And so we covered all of that stuff. And then after that meeting, she asked me if I would write the Gaps Baby book. So right in, right now I'm in the oh. process of doing two books. Oh, that's exciting. With effort. I know. It's a lot, though. Yeah. You must be <laughs> flat out. <laughs> I love it, though. My kids yeah. are at the perfect age. It's, yes, it's, that's right. It's not so hard now. I love it. I love this work. It's just amazing to see Mm. that you can just eat food, real food. Yes. And the Lord can just support your body and and you can heal. I mean, it's it's what our bodies are meant to do. It's so amazing. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's so good. Well, I look forward to to seeing those books. I want to, um, yeah, there's a lot of people that ask about babies and feeding babies. So that will be awesome. Yeah, if they have any questions, have them send them. On the bottom of every one of my posts on Nourishing Plot, there is my email address. Have them send them so that I can make sure that I address things in the book. Oh, that great. Thank you. I don't know. Oh, thank you. That's really good. Okay, so there you go, guys. If you have a question about these things, send it on. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate your, your time, and um, I hope that I hope that the books go well, and we'll look forward to those. And like I said, I'll have links on the show notes. Um, but go ahead over to Becky's website, Nourishing Plot, and have a read. Um, there's so many interesting articles and recipes over there, and I'm going to have a good look at some of those recipes that I, I was looking through for some information on, you know, different subjects that I was looking up, and I kept finding these recipes going, oh, I need to try that. Oh, I need to try that. <laughs> <laughs> So well, that good. pizza one is a good one. Yeah, we, we I'm definitely going to try good, that one. <laughs> that's an easy travel food too. Yeah. Oh, good, good. And it would also be great for school if they can have nuts. Otherwise, um, seeds, I suppose you could use seed meal. But, ah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And hopefully we'll chat to you again sometime. Sounds great. Thank you, Joe. It was good to talk to you. Okay, bye. Bye. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.